in a classic video essay is this a video essay fashion i won't begin this analysis if it is an analysis of purple hearts by describing it but rather by describing something i intend to compare it to that something is dogfight which was originally a movie released in 1991 starring river phoenix and lily taylor but which was first recommended to me as a stage musical by my theater friend murray you might remember her from the teen wolf video naturally after falling in love with the cast recording i fell in love with the film as well it's one of those before sunrise-esque romances that takes place mostly in one night, but it did come first. I'm actually in the middle of watching that series for the first time because I knew I'd be drawing this comparison, and if you're a fan of it, I bet you'd also love Dogfight. The single night it follows is actually the one before the day of JFK's assassination, but more importantly for the story's purposes, it's the last night stateside for one Eddie Birdlace before he's shipped off to Vietnam. As a self send off, he and his buddies are throwing a party known as the Dogfight. They all put some money towards a pot to be won by the Marine with the ugliest date. This is why Eddie picks up Rose, a sheltered waitress with a passion for folk music, and if you're shocked and appalled by that meet cute, meet ugly, then I don't blame you. That was my initial response when Marie summarized it for me too, but that's exactly why I bring it up, because I reacted similarly to hearing about Purple Hearts for the first time. I mean, a liberal diabetic enters into a fraudulent marriage with a conservative Marine to access insulin? That's straight up nightmare fuel, but I was seeing enough genuine love for it mixed in with the hate that I earnestly wondered if it would surprise me like Dogfight did before it, if it would thematically make some meaningful out of its disconcerting premise at every turn, or at some turns. What I mean to get across is that I didn't go into Purple Hearts a hater. I wasn't scoping out a potential video subject. I just wanted to form my own opinion, and it's largely thanks to Dogfight, maybe across the universe, I've only seen it once, that I don't operate under the assumption every military romance is going to be nationalistic propaganda. It just so happens that Purple Hearts is. Like, they literally adjusted a little bit of dialogue for permission to film on an actual base. In my imagination exists a dogfightified version of Purple Hearts that totally rocks, but that's not even the film the creators tried and failed to make. They tried and failed to make their very own vision. What I want to do in this video is explain how they failed both me and themselves. After the break, of course. This video is brought to you by our old friend Atlas VPN. As if you don't know, VPNs are virtual private networks which are best for cybersecurity but also useful for tricking streaming services like Netflix into letting you see shows and movies that aren't available wherever you live. Like have you ever stumbled upon a YouTube video blocked in your country? VPNs work around that by bypassing geo restrictions which can also also save you money because prices vary across borders, believe it or not. Back to cybersecurity though, Atlas VPN protects my devices from malware and me from identity theft. If you're online anywhere nearly as often as I am, a virtual private network is a must. Would you play football without a helmet? Put on eyeshadow? without primer. You really shouldn't be raw dogging the World Wide Web, and Atlas is the most affordable, best protection on the market. It doesn't sacrifice your loading speed, you can use it on an unlimited number of devices, and you can get a three-year subscription for just $183 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in my description to visit their website. In case I didn't well enough establish the premise of Purple Hearts, allow me to be more clear. Cassie, played by Sophia Carson of A Cinderella story, If the Shoe Fits, is a starving musician type. She's got a BLM flag as well as a pride flag hanging from her balcony, she's an immigrant's daughter, and she has an ethical code that doesn't include blind obedience. But perhaps more defining than any of those characteristics is her propensity for keeping her hair tucked into her clothes. She's also a type 1 diabetic struggling to afford insulin when she meets a marine named Luke, played by Nicholas Galitzine of a Cinderella a story if the shoe is sold by a woman-owned business. Like Cassie, Luke has a major financial problem, which is that he owes his ex-dealer thousands. One would assume, of course, drug money, but the story goes he stole a car from his dad, wrecked it, and borrowed from his dealer to pay him back. Trust that this is the least of my worries, but I seriously don't get why, if Luke was going to be a recovered addict regardless, which he is, 
this convoluted backstory was necessary. I mean, I would have actually given the writers props for the misdirect if it turned out he was never an addict and we jumped to that conclusion. It would be in line with the theme of boxing people in, right? As it stands though, we're entirely correct to assume his history with drug usage, so why can't the money he canonically owes a drug dealer just be drug money. The only answer that comes to mind is to establish why he and his father are estranged, but that would have been better left ambiguous. It's not exactly hard to imagine why an ex-addict might be at odds with their folks. I can connect dots, I swear I can. Anyway, married marines make more than unmarried marines and military wives get military health benefits, so the two tie the knot with plans to divorce after his deployment in Iraq. In the meantime, they carry on a fake long distance relationship which develops into a real relationship when he's sent home early with a purple heart due to injury. Now, apart from the military romance aspect, Purple Hearts might not sound all that similar to Dogfight, and at the end of the day, it isn't. It's not a period piece, first of all, and rather than spanning a single night, its timeline is actually quite sprawling, as is the runtime, by the way. I think I personally draw parallels between them because they're both small-scale stories with large-scale themes. They're both non-ensemble socio-political commentaries. Through mainly two characters and their relationship with each other, we're meant to come away having learned something or at least considered something about our culture, our society. My favorite thing about Dogfight is the way it goes about accomplishing this. Let me tell you something about bullshit. It's everywhere. You hit me with little, I buy it. I hit you with little, you buy it. Right. It doesn't make us idiots. That's what makes us buddies. We buy with the core hands out, and that's what makes us Marines. And the core is buying all the bullshit from President Kennedy, and President Kennedy's buying right. all the bullshit from everybody in the U.S. and fucking A. Right. And that's what makes us Americans. It's still bullshit. Right. And we're in it up to our goddamn lips, buddy. Eddie and Rose have very few overtly political conversations. She tells him she wants to join the Peace Corps or move south to help with the civil rights movement. He tells her about being recruited to enlist at just 16, but they only have one overtly political argument. Their music can change the world. Well, if you want to change the world, Rose, why don't you join the Marines and start shooting? Shooting changes things real quick. I can't believe you just said that. Oh, well, I just did. That's ridiculous. Shooting doesn't solve anything. You shoot at people, what do you got? People shooting back at you. When you sing to people, your message goes straight to the soul. You open up a whole new point of view. You disarm them. Well, all I know is that President Kennedy's sending troops across the big waters to make some changes, and he certainly didn't issue them no guitars. Well, there are people who do use music over aggression. Have you ever heard the song, We Shall Overcome? Huh? What's so funny? What, what? Why are you laughing? I'm not laughing. Yes, you are. You think this is some joke? What? I bet you've never even heard of this song. <laughs> Bullshit. Burrs and goofs on it all the time. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, all that proves is your friend Burzen is not only a cheat, but a complete moron. Hey! Hold it! Hold it! What's going on here? I ain't gonna spend my last few hours stateside arguing with you, especially you. I like you. Damn it. I'm, I'm sorry if, uh, I'm sorry if, if I upset you in any way. That song was just very important to me, and I don't like to see it ridiculed like that. I understand that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, so shut up. Thank you, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, so you shut up. Outside of that exchange, Dogfight's messaging is largely subtextual. I mean, the musical is more apparent, as they tend to be, but I do think it's a little bit worse for that. For instance, one of the only major deviations it made from the film was the addition of a sexual assault scene to really drive home the villainy of Eddie's friend group, and here I thought their villainy was made 
quite clear by the ugly girl contest. Toxic masculinity and misogyny are, on the other hand, perhaps the best example of what the movie wants you to read between the lines. Eddie very nearly backs out of the dogfight before the arrival of his best friend bolsters his false bravado. This party's really no big deal. We don't have to go in here. Oh, I'd like to. No, there's... Yeah. Well, we can go somewhere else if you just want to dance. That's okay. Then, when he finally ditches the other Marines to go apologize to Rose and take her out for real, it's while they're each busy objectifying women in their own way. Every time we cut away from the leads from that point on, it's to see what buffoonery Eddie would be up to if he hadn't met Rose. So, when I say I long for a dogfightified version of Purple Hearts, what I mean is that its premise isn't the problem. I feel like I've seen a lot of criticism begin and end with a description of the setup, but I'm of the opinion that there's endless potential for meaning to be found within the story of a sham military marriage for health benefits. There are so many angles one could take with that, which could be stooped in subtlety or obnoxiously straightforward, as long as they were poignant. You see, it's not a film that aimed for dogfight and landed on Nicholas Sparks. That's love and honor. Purple Hearts, aimed for Nicholas Sparks and landed on Hallmark. I find the problem with it to be a distinct lack of poignance, which is the natural consequence of a vapid mission statement, to be harsh. Look no further than what the cast and crew have gone on record to say about their intentions. In order for the red heart and the blue heart to kind of turn purple, you have to have them be kind of extreme. They learn to become more moderate and listen to each other and to love. That was the biggest, most important part of the theme. We feel like people need to grow and need to start to become more moderate. It's two hearts, one red, one blue, two worlds apart, who are really raised to hate each other. Through the power of love, they learn to lead with empathy and compassion and love each other and turn into this beautiful shade of purple. So what they were going for was colors by Halsey if he decided purple was for him. And that's pretty transparent. The entire runtime is filled with these pseudo-political arguments that aren't really about any one particular issue or belief, but about their identities as a liberal and conservative. It's all buzzwords and no substance. You probably tweet a lot about other people's rights, but when it actually comes down Sorry, to fighting- Sorry, it's fascinating to me. Do you, do you have a PhD in mansplaining? When it, when it actually comes down to fighting for these rights, you don't want to do anything, right? Because guns are mean, you're a pacifist. If I can trust a lib who doesn't give a shit about the law or the military, I can sure- I have an ethical me. code that doesn't include blind obedience, and I desperately need this to literally survive. Whereas you could be I don't know, stockpiling supplies for your pro militia. If I was trepidatious in making this video for any reason, it was because I don't have the time in a mere movie review to explain why I think centrism is an apathetic ideology. That's a bigger conversation than the one we are having about the theming of Purple Hearts Netflix. I realized though that I don't have to convince you of all that because Centrism could be the most noble, most correct ideology in the world, and that wouldn't make it conducive to good storytelling. Maybe it's not fair to say all things in moderation could never work as a theme, but I just don't think art is well suited to pushing the absence of agenda. Fiction thrives in the extreme. Like, Scrooge doesn't come out of A Christmas Carol having found the middle ground between greed and generosity. Sociopolitical commentaries especially kind of go hand in hand with points of view more profound than through the power of love. I do, however, want us to collectively pretend for a moment that we're in agreement with the movie's takeaway. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who believes in their heart of purple hearts that what we need as a society is to become more moderate. Yeah, yeah, this pin, this pin points both up and down. Because I think as a country we need to stop arguing. Even now. Do you think this movie successfully promotes tolerance? I don't. I'd be willing to bet some of you haven't tuned into Purple Hearts, but that you have seen a clip of it floating around in which one of Luke's friends says something profoundly disturbing. Cassie stands up to him and Luke chastises her for ruining the evening. And hunting down some goddamn A-Rabs, baby! <laughs> Woo! 
Really? You got a problem with that? Arab is an ethnicity and you're making it sound like you're hunting down everyone of a certain ethnicity, which sounds kind of problematic. Yeah, Cassie, he gets it. He's just stirring the pot. Thank you for the sensitivity training. Can hey, no, 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 no. What exactly would you like us to do, huh? Go over there and teach them pronouns? How about starting with knowing who your actual enemy is and not making disturbing generalizations? How about Watch that? Watch your tone huh? when you talk to me. Luke, get your girl. That's Excuse enough. me? Get no, it. he doesn't get me. Yeah, That's he does. enough. Both of you, sit down. Do what the man says. No. <sighs> God, I just love nuanced conversations like these. Armando is a dick, but I, I, I don't think you understand what we're preparing ourselves to go and do. Is it really worth ruining everybody's night for? I'm pretty sure I wasn't the one who ruined the night. I'm pretty sure it was your friend shouting, kill all Arabs. Oh, what, because you were going to have the best night of your life if you didn't say that? Sitting at a table full of people you feel superior to. Yeah, well, not being okay. a racist tool is kind of superior, though, isn't it? Hey, yeah, but without guys like Armando, do you really think this country would be safe from terrorists? Mm -hmm. No. Look, and, and you preach this future is female. But how do you think those women feel in Iraq? I think defenders of this film see this scene as being taken out of context. I think when the director says the leads had to start out extremists in order to grow, this is the moment she's referring to. Cassie certainly doesn't engage in any radical activism. I think it's notable that Luke's actor felt the need to clarify that Cassie educated him after this scene when he shared it. Personally, I don't know what education Nicholas was referring to. There's no reason to believe that by the time the credits roll, he wouldn't do this all again. If the director sincerely meant to depict growth on his end, she forgot. And if certain viewers come out of it under the impression he's a changed man, I think they're doing work the script didn't. It would have been easy actually for this moment to contribute to Luke's journey to the center of the two-party system. For one thing, he could have apologized later on or even right outside of the restaurant. Better yet, there could have been a whole callback scene, perhaps in place of a jalapeno eating contest. Cassie stands up for what's right again and this time... Luke backs her. If that had happened, I'd agree that the scene has been taken out of context because the context would reveal the narrative to be on Cassie's side. As it stands, the narrative is in staunch agreement with Luke. Never once does he concede, never once does he waver, never once does he change. But Cassie? She adds an American flag to her assortment. She learns the valuable lesson that not all men. She starts dedicating her alt music to the troops. This is what I mean when I say they failed their own vision as much as they did mine. Of course, I want Cassie to make a progressive out of Luke, but that was never in the cards. If we take them at their word, the cast and crew wanted both leads to suck any sense of conviction out of the other. But what happened was Luke made a conservative out of Cassie. More like red hearts. Am I right?